Hi everyone, my name is Carissa, and today my talk is going to be about um, how you can run remote research with kids who are so over it. Just to clarify, uh, what I mean by kids here is uh, kids below 13 years old, more specifically uh, between the ages of 7 to 12 year olds. So just a quick introduction. Um, my background is in developmental psychology. I have worked with kids over the past 10 over years. Right now, I am a senior user experience researcher at Roblox. And previously, I was working at YouTube for the past four years-ish. Um, I was working on like kids and families products at YouTube. Yeah. So here's a quick overview of what we're going to go over today. First, um, I want to set the context. You know, we, I want to talk about like what is covered for the scope of the talk today and what isn't covered. And then we can talk a little bit about um, you know, how to prepare for the session before. For example, like, you know, best ways to set it up, best ways to recruit kids and parents, and also like how you can uh, engage with and work with parents. And then we're gonna dive into three practical tips for running remote research with kids. And at the same time, I'm also going to be talking, giving some examples about how, I, how I've done this in the past. So some quick background. Um, and again, this isn't surprising to anybody. Running research with kids is very different from running research with adults. It comes with a lot of unique challenges because kids are at a different, of different ages, are at different um, developmental levels. And for example, in terms of language, um, they might not have as good a literacy skills. They can't read as well. They, they might not be able to express themselves as well as adults can. And then in terms of attention span, kids have pretty limited attention span and it's kind of ridiculous to expect them to sit through a one, one hour session and remotely. And so it's, you know, it's important to kind of give them breaks in between and also like mix up the different tasks so that you know, they're just not just sitting there answering questions the whole time. Um, obviously, like sometimes um, there's also this um, adult child dynamic we have to take note of like you know kids might see adults as an authority figure and because of that you know they're afraid to kind of like be open and honest with their thoughts so you need to make sure that you know you have, have enough time to make kids feel comfortable so that they're comfortable with sharing their honest thoughts with you throughout the study obviously uh, there's also a lot of like legal constraints and requirements when you're working with kids um, there's a lot of things around you know data collection data storage and how you share data later on with your stakeholders so um, these are all really, really important things to, to take into consideration. Um, doing this remotely, you know, makes this even more difficult, right? There's all these like technology issues, like setting up the platform, Wi-Fi, internet connection, all of that. And then at the same time, sometimes when you're running remote research, when the parent is just right next to the kid, the parent might, oh, might you know, unintentionally try to interfere and like try to steer kids towards whatever they think is the right answer. So you need to think about how you can navigate that um, parental interference. Um, obviously, over Zoom, it's kind of difficult to read nonverbal cues, which are really important with kids especially. It's important to look at their body language, things like that. Um, and this might be difficult sometimes um, in a remote setting. And obviously, getting them engaged remotely is even more challenging because, you know, it's hard to, like, get them to refocus and, you know, pay attention. And you don't have that, like, face-to-face -face interaction. But then we can talk about what are some different ways you can kind of make this a little bit better for kids. All right. So um, what's covered today is I'm just going to talk a little bit about, you know, like, some practical tips you can run remote sessions with kids. Um, and this could be used for like maybe one-on-one -on -one usability testing or situations where you want to like test different concepts with kids. Um, what it isn't covered is, you know, like I'm not going to deep dive into like what are the best ways to set up technology. Um, we're not going to cover in-depth recruiting tips. Uh, and this is also not about like legal advice because this differs depending on where you are. Um, and then again, running in-person research has a lot of different dynamics. So that's also really different. And um, we're not going to cover other methods like, oh, you know, how you can best run diary studies with kids. All right, so before the session, you know, you need to make sure that obviously you're rec recruiting the right participants. And a lot of times when you are sending out screener surveys, parents are the ones answering them, right? So how do you make, make it such that, you know, parents are checking in with their kids 
um, so that they're answering the questions accurately, right? So maybe throughout the survey, you have to make sure that you have to keep reminding parents, okay, at this point, this is a point where you, you should be consulting your kid um, to fill out the questions. You know, some ways you can do this, you can get parents to kind of like maybe screenshot certain parts of the app so that, you know, there's a little bit more involvement from the kid's part. Um, and then sometimes, you know, if you if you want to like further ensure that kids are comfortable speaking to a stranger on a remote session, you could ask the parents if they're open to a phone call before the session. So you can actually like talk to the kids to make sure that, you know, they're the right fit for the study. And then uh, obviously it will be really helpful if you send explicit detailed instructions on how parents can help set up this, the session and all the different apps and technology that's needed prior to the session. And then if even needed, you could meet with them 10 minutes before the session so that you can get all of this out of the way before stakeholders come in to observe the sessions. It's important to give parents a clear overview of the study, like what is covered in the study, what kids are required to do, what parents are required to do. And then it's also important to be transparent to them about how data is collected. They were going to be recording videos, audio, there might be stakeholders observing the session and then how we're handling all of this data storage. Um, and like I said before, like sometimes it's a bit tricky to limit and navigate this uh, parental interference. So it's important again to give parents explicit instructions from the start, you know, tell them what is asked of them. <laughs> and then during the session, if you find that the parent keeps interfering, you could just, you know, be upfront with the parent and be, and tell the parent, uh, you know, like maybe we should give the kid a chance to answer the question first before you can chime in later. Um, and if, you know, in the worst case scenario, you could also give parents a task to complete as a child is being interviewed. For example, you could give them like a short survey on looking at the parental um, monitoring techniques, things like that, just so that, you know, the parent has something to do and isn't like constantly interfering during the session. So yeah, right now I, we can jump right into the three practical tips that I have for running remote, remote research with kids. So the three things I'm covering today, first is around like, what are the best ways to build rapport with kids? Because this is really, really important, especially when you're running research with kids. The second is, you know, how you can be sensitive to children's needs. Like I said, um, a lot of things might come out during the research with kids. And so it's important for the researcher to be flexible, to be sensitive and to let the kid know that they can stop the research session at any time. And then the third one is around like how we can help kids overcome this social desirability bias, right? A lot of times kids might feel like um, they need to answer a certain way to please the adult. And so there's some um, techniques you can try to navigate this. Yeah, so the first is around building rapport. So I'll talk about how we can leverage play and how we can, how we should spend more time connecting with the kids rather than focusing just on getting the research questions answered. Unlike research with adults, where maybe you sometimes spend only like five to 10 minutes on background section, for research with kids, I would typically invest more time uh, trying to like warm the kids up and have different icebreaker activities. So I think the, the most important thing is, you know, you shouldn't go into it thinking of it as, oh, this is a research session. I have all these research goals I need to complete because if, if, you, if you're going in thinking that way, it's going to be really challenging, especially when, you know, it doesn't turn out the way that you want it to, which is very typical of sessions with kids. Um, another thing is you need to make kids feel like they're the expert. Like I said, there's this whole adult child dynamic, right? Like kids already see adults as authority figures. So, you know, we need to like come down to the level um, and let them feel like, you know, they're the experts and they're the ones who have the knowledge to share with you. So, um, for example, you let them talk about, get them to talk about things they're most familiar with, like, oh, tell me about what you like to do. Show me what you, uh, what, what are some of the things at home that you really like. Get, get them to like, you know, get up and pick some items to show it to you and then have it be a little bit more interactive rather than them just sitting at the desk communicating with you over Zoom. Again, like I said, there's a lot of different activities you can uh, used to kind of warm kids up. For example, um, I guess in the context of Roblox, one thing we can do is, oh, show me your Roblox. And then how about uh, the, one of the activity is let's dress our avatars in something silly. And so this like gives kids the opportunities to kind of like warm up, open up and, you know, like make them realize that this is really not uh, a formal like interview session. Yeah. All right. The second part about building rapport is how you can leverage play. So, you know, kids learn a lot through play. 
And we can learn so much by either playing with them or watching how kids play. And in, again, in the case of Roblox, right? One thing I've, I like to do in my research sessions is at the start, I would like spend 15, 20 minutes to just play with kids in Roblox, getting them to show me their favorite games, getting them to teach me how to play their favorite games. And all of this, through all of these interactions, you and the stakeholders can learn so much about the kids. If you want to make this more structured, you could give um, stakeholders a list of different things to observe. For example, you know, as I'm trying to play with a kid, we can look at, you know, how does a kid navigate the UI in the app? What are some of the pain points a kid might have to as they're trying to find a game, as they're trying to add somebody as a friend, all of these different things. And in fact, like I've heard from a lot of stakeholders that observing kids play actually gives them a lot of insights into, you know, how kids actually um, use the app in context rather than getting them to tell us, you know, the issues that they have with the app. So the second thing we're going to talk about is, you know, how we can be sensitive to children's needs. So um, either having sibling or friendship pairs for your research sessions. And then the other tip is, you know, like get kids to show you, not tell you. Kids are more comfortable opening up when somebody familiar is around, right? Because if you think about it in a research, remote research session, it might feel a little bit intimidating that like a random adult stranger is asking me all these questions, it feels like a formal interview setting, right? But then if you let them bring along their friend or their sibling, it feels a little bit more informal and more comfortable. And a lot of times having uh, pairs also help kid, keep kids truthful because, you know, um, they actually call each other out if, they, if they're lying about something. And on top of that, it's really important that, you know, you make use of the social interaction between the kids to help you generate more information and like glean more insight into what's going on. For example, you can get kids to play together. Um, in Roblox scenario, it would be like, we can get two kids or two friends to play together. And then as you're listening to them interact with each other on a platform, you actually learn so much about all of the different things that they're going through. The next important part is, you know, don't ask kids to tell you how they do things. Um, sometimes it might be difficult for them to express accurately what they're trying to do. So rather than that, get them to show you how they do it. Um, so for example, like instead of asking them, oh, you know, what are some difficulties you might have with uh, finding a game on Roblox? I would tell them, okay, why don't you share your screen with me? Show me how you do it. And again, with kids, um, getting them to talk aloud is not natural. So maybe you can like, try to rephrase this in a different way to tell them, oh, you know, I can't read your mind. So can you please tell me what you're trying to, what, what you're trying to do here? And like, just again, like you need a lot of additional prompts to guide kids along the way. Other tips are, you know, other than getting them to talk about it, you could let them draw it out, um, let them act it out. Like basically give them a lot of different options to kind of express what they need, what they want to tell you. Importantly, also make sure that you're observing the body language and other non-verbal cues because sometimes even if they tell you they like something, you can see their frown, right? Or their little frown to show that maybe they don't really like it or there's, there's something confusing that they themselves uh, aren't able to like, express to you. All right, okay. The last tip I have is um, overcoming social desirability bias. This, this is actually common even for adults, right? Like with, um, adults also feel like they have to say the right thing in a session and sometimes they feel feel bad about giving you negative feedback so you know there are also some tips about like how you can gamify this to encourage kids to be more open and honest in a research session all right so like i said it's important at the start of a session to spend time to make sure that kids are feeling comfortable right so then um, in the same vein we need to set the stage right at the start to let kids feel more open and comfortable about talking about things that they don't like. And so at the start, you know, of the session, you can, it's important to tell kids um, what is the goal of the research session and why, why we're talking to them today. So it's not like to add additional stress to them about, you know, like the, the responsibility in this, but, you know, tell them that when they are giving us honest feedback, it, it helps us make our product better for other kids. And sometimes this motivates them to, to be more open about uh, providing negative feedback. And then some icebreaker activity suggestions could be, you know, maybe you can get kids to talk about things that they don't like in their life, things they don't like about school, you know, just any everyday things. And then, or, you know, um, when they're showing you how they navigate with the app, you can tell, ask them to show you one thing, one, one or two things about the app that doesn't work well for you. And um, sometimes in some scenarios, when I feel like a kid really, feel, when you can tell that a kid 
really feel uncomfortable about giving you negative feedback, you can try this prompt where you tell where you tell them that you know sometimes you know you've heard from other kids that they really don't like this. Um, what about you? And sometimes when they hear that, oh, other kids have also provided negative feedback before, they might be a little bit more comfortable in telling you that they don't like certain things. Another way to do this is try to kind of like gamify to get more honest feedback. So for example, instead of using like traditional grading skills, like on a scale of one to five, how do you like this, right? You can turn it into a game um, where you tell the kid, my task for you today is to look for things that are wrong with this, right? And when you turn it into like some kind of game where they're supposed to look for problems with the app, they're more likely to be honest and give you negative feedback. So yes, uh, as a recap, these are the top three tips that I have for you for running re remote research with kids. Again, it's not limited to these three, but these are the top things that I found have been helpful for me and my coworkers. So the first one again is building rapport with kids um, and then being sensitive to their needs. And then the third one is how you can gamify to encourage um, kids to be more open and honest in a session. Thank you so much. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to email me at uh, ckang at Thank you.